Hi folks, my name is Kaylin Henderson and I'm a staff scientist at the NASA Exoplanet Archive, which is one of the many projects run by the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute or NEXI out of IPAC at Caltech. Here I'm going to give you an overview of the data tools and services offered by the NASA Exoplanet Archive uh, and that are freely available for use by the professional community as well as the general public. In particular, I'm going to highlight some new products that we're releasing as part of a long-term large-scale revamp. So to get started, this is the home page or front page of the NASA Exoplanet Archive. There are a lot of different types of interfaces here, and I'll begin with our primary data products, our planet data tables. Those of you who have used our services before are likely familiar with our confirmed planets table. Over the next few months, however, we will fully phase out this table as part of our aforementioned revamp process, and we encourage all users to instead begin using its replacement, our new planetary systems table. This browser tab shows a documentation page to help walk you through our table migration and provides descriptions of the new tables and how to access them. So going back to the home page, one of the ways you can access this new planetary systems table is by clicking on this button in the top left that shows the current tally of confirmed exoplanets. And this directs you to an interactive version of the planetary systems table. Give it a second while it loads. So in contrast to the confirmed planets table, which contains exactly one row per confirmed planet or a few thousand rows, this planetary systems table contains one row for each solution or self-consistent parameter set for each planet. As you can see, this means that the table has nearly 30,000 rows. When you first load this table, it is filtered to show only the default parameter set for each planet, which is to say that you will see only the solution set with the most complete or precise set of parameters from the refereed literature. Let's remove this filter and look at all of the solutions for a sample planet. I've picked Kepler 10b. So we can see that there are several different types of solutions, including many from the refereed literature, so what published confirm in the solution type column means, as well as Kepler project deliveries. You can see Kepler project candidate in the solution type, and it points you to specific versions of the KOI table. Uh, and this includes solutions from when the object's disposition was merely a candidate. In scrolling to the right, we see a multitude of parameters for the planet, radius, mass, eccentricity, equilibrium temperature. For the star, metallicity, effective temperature, uh, and for the system as a whole. So here we've got coordinates, distance, uh, photometric magnitudes, and then some logistical columns here at the end. I'll note that the underlying catalog for our database is version eight of the test input catalog uh, or TIC. So many of the stellar parameter references you can see here or the system parameter references you can see here uh, point specifically to TIC V8. Uh, so only a subset of data columns are shown by default and you can select or deselect these as you see fit using our column controls panel in the upper left. Go up here, select columns. You can see we have different groupings of different types of columns and you can check, uncheck, uh, or even expand them if you want. By default, we show the value for orbital period, but you can also look at the uncertainties in separate columns and uh, a limit flag. Here you can see columns for stellar data, system data, uh, et cetera. You are also able to sort, filter, reorder, and remove columns by interacting directly with the table. Uh, so to test that out, let's go ahead and move the orbital period column. Just click and drag. Let's move it to the right, the number of planets column. Uh, and we can look at the default parameter set, set this to one, for each planet in a system with three stars. And let's clear the planet name here. Uh, and then we can sort the orbital period column in order of decreasing period. So we can see there are 53 planets uh, in systems with three stars. And here we've, we've sorted the orbital period decreasing. So going from a little bit over 16,000 days and on down. 
Uh, you can also create a user account and save customized versions of any of our planet data tables for future use. So up here in the menu bar, you can see that I'm currently logged into my profile, C. Henderson. Uh, and if I click on hover over user preferences, I have the ability to uh, save a given filtered or sorted version of this table and then load from any of my previously saved versions of the table. And this persists through when you log in, log out, log in. Uh, another way to access data in our planetary systems table is to use the table access protocol or TAP. So if I go to this third browser tab here, this shows our documentation page for our TAP service. This allows you to filter and download your desired version of a planet data table by constructing your URL in a browser tab or even embedding the relevant query in your own piece of software. So to identify the database names of specific parameter columns, please check out this documentation page. It says fourth column, fourth tab here. And this provides the mapping between the column name, so for each of these little tables, the leftmost column uh, that you would use in your tap query, uh, and the label, second column, and description uh, that you would see in the interactive versions of the given table. So from the planetary systems table, let's go back to our first tab. You can also access our new system overview pages. Uh, and you do so by clicking on the blue hyperlink for given planet name. So let's again filter on Kepler 10b. Let's get rid of our previous filters. Go ahead and click on the blue hyperlink under planet name. This brings up a separate tab, the system overview page. So whereas we used to have a variety of different overview pages for different types of objects and different types of data, we have consolidated all of our archive products into one page. At the top here, we have a graphical description of the given planetary system generated using physical data. So we've got the host star and you can see it's labeled. Uh, and you get the default alias, its radius, its stellar effective temperature as well as any planets in the system colored according to their disposition. So purple means they're confirmed planets, get their names, uh, and if measured, their radii. Below this, there is a schematic of the orbital architecture of the system. So we can see that this system, Kepler-10, has a star named Kepler-10 with two planets orbiting it with default aliases Kepler-10b and Kepler-10c as well as an overview of the planet discovery information over here to the right. You can see the discovery method, the year, discovery reference, etc. As we scroll down, we can see that different sections contain parameter data for the different objects in the system. So you can see Kepler-10, the stellar information, planetary parameters for B and for C. Uh, if we go ahead and click on the section for Kepler-10b, you can see that there's a different column for each of the solutions listed in the planetary systems table. And one neat feature here is that if you click on the icon to the right of the manuscript reference, so if we click on this, this red one for Estevez 2015, it highlights the corresponding, see now we're in a different section, stellar parameter set. This is an easy way to identify which solutions are tied to each other and thus physically consistent. So if we keep scrolling down, Since this system contains a Kepler object, the ancillary information section provides access to the different Kepler project data products. So if we click here, you can see that we have data validation reports, data validation summaries, T-cert reports. Uh, and then if we click down here, you can even see the different KOI solutions. Scrolling down below this, the nearby data section then lists all known objects within 30 arc seconds of the planet host star, as well as any data files in our inventory for this system, such as, as you can see here, Kepler light curves. Finally, the bibliography section provides a list replete with links to ADS for any manuscript that discovers that discusses the given system. So let's go back to our first browser tab, go back to the home page. And I'll mention that although the planetary systems table is our new workhorse table for planet data, we host several other planet data tables that you can see in this section down here. So if you go down to work with data, <clears throat> this includes tables that are tailored to planets discovered using the microlensing, bottom left, 
uh, or direct imaging, bottom right, techniques, as well as tables containing transmission or emission spectroscopy, right above the microlensing and direct imaging. There is also our planetary systems composite data table, at which we'll take a look at now. So I'm clicking on planetary systems composite data, which is now in beta release. So take us to another interactive table. So similar to the retiring confirmed planets table, the planet, this planetary systems composite table has exactly one row per confirmed planet. You can see it's just a few thousand count down here. The big difference between this table and the planetary systems table that we were just looking at is that here the data for a given planet are not necessarily drawn from a single data source. While this means that the data may not be physically consistent, and we have this red banner warning users of that right here, this table does pull from our full data inventory to fill in gaps in the planetary systems table, making it far more complete and useful for getting a sense of overarching demographic distributions. So to get a sense of this mixing and matching of data, let's go back up here to our column selection pane. I'm going to clear everything. I'm going to add just planet name. I'm going to add a few specific planet parameter columns. I'm going to go down here. I'm going to go expand this. I'm going to add the planet radius and Earth radii value, as well as the reference. Uh, I'm also going to add planet density the reference, uh, and then also eccentricity, and also insulation flux. And so let's see how that looks. And let's specifically go to our favorite planet again, Kepler-10b. Uh, I'm going to expand these columns so you can see them, read their contents a little bit better. All right, there we go. So as we can see, the planet radius here and the planet density come from, come from one single reference. Uh, but their eccentricity and insulation flux from, come, come from two other different references. If you can see that here. This table is also one of the few places in the archive where we perform calculations. If we clear the filter on the planet name, we can see that the reference for planet radius is listed as, quote, calculated value, unquote, for many planets. So here we use the Chen and Kipping mass radius relation. Uh, and we also perform calculations for other parameters. So you can even see that here for planet density, which is one of those other parameters. Uh, we also plan to expand the number of parameters for which we include calculated values in this specific table. So stay tuned on that front. Going back to our homepage, I'll show you now the different types of figures that we make available, uh, which you can access by clicking on this plots button down here. So this page gives you access to downloadable versions of each of our pre-generated plots. And these are updated for each of our data releases. These are designed to be talk ready, so you can insert them into your slides and sleep soundly knowing that you have the most current tabulation of exoplanet data. We also provide colorblind friendly versions of each of these plots. You can get those by clicking on the links as identified. And for several of these plots, we additionally include a link to an interactive plotting environment generated by the filter graph team at Vanderbilt. So if we go back to our front page again, scroll up, hit home. I'll briefly mention that we also host contributed data sets from a variety of space and ground-based missions. So if I hover over the data tab here, in the second column, you can see and peruse all of the Kepler mission products, as well as photometric time series from surveys such as KELT. Uh, there it is, under transit surveys. And UKERT, the microlensing survey over here. Uh, FDL Pi Atmos atmospheric data and data from the Asteria CubeSat, among others. In addition to data, we offer the ability for you to use any of a variety of data analysis tools we have available. So if I scroll down here to the section Tools and Services, you can see those. Some examples include our periodogram tool right here, the ExoFast software suite. This is developed by Jason Eastman, and it's for jointly fitting transit and radial velocity data. We also have our transit and ephemeris service to help plan your next observing run or to utilize some extra time you have at the end of a given night. 
We also host data from the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. And you can view a table of the current TESS objects of interest, or TOIs, by clicking here, it says Test Project Candidates. So it delivers you to another interactive table. And this one contains data delivered by the TESS project, and it's updated daily. So if we filter on a specific TOI, I'm going to type 101 here, and then click on the hyperlink, we are directed to our ExoFOP test page for the given object. ExoFOP stands for Exoplanet Follow-Up Observing Program, and is designed to be a sandbox for the community to support follow-up of TOIs. So there are tabular data, time series data, and image data, and users are able to contribute their own data through this service. The left-hand side of an object-specific ExoFOP test page lets you access the different types of data uh, available for a given object and also explore the relevant inventory hosted by the NASA Exoplanet Archive, which we've been talking about mostly here, uh, as well as other online data repositories, including URSA and SIMBAD, MAST, and the Keck Observatory Archive. So from here, you can also get to the ExoFOP test homepage. From here, you can view the different observation summary files, imaging, spectroscopy, et cetera, over here. Uh, and you can search for any data grouped by a given data tag. So if I uh, go to here, the second data tag search bar, and I type in Ciardi for David Ciardi, the chief scientist of the NASA Exoplanet Archive, I see any data that he has uploaded. So there's actually a whole swath, 18,780 different types of data uh, tagged by and uploaded by David Ciardi. So I'll close by taking us back to the archive homepage and noting that we have a bountiful reservoir of documentation pages, which you can access by clicking this purple button down here. Uh, and this is to help you as you explore our different data tools and services. We also have a social media presence. You can follow us up here. Uh, click on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube up here in the top right. And last but not least, finally, we have a help desk through which you can reach out to us with any questions or clarifications that you may have. And one way to access this help desk is by clicking on the Contact Us button here in the bottom right. So thank you for watching and have fun delving into everything we know as humans about every confirmed exoplanet that has hitherto been discovered.